Well, again, it's good to be with everybody via Zoom in our midweek Bible study and devotional. I guess you can say that I'm calling this little talk tonight sort of a pick me up in the middle of the week. Um, we, I don't know how Christians, true Christians who are truly faithful to God and seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and fighting the fight of faith, preaching the truth, are not vexed by this evil world in which we live in. Uh, I don't know how it is that a person who is a Christian can get along in his faith without thinking about the eternal abode of the blessed, heaven itself. The Bible clearly teaches us that we're saved by hope. Now, you've heard this defined before, but we'll do it again here, that the hope of the Bible means an expectation on the part of the faithful Christian with a strong and earnest desire to receive what he has a right to expect, eternal life in heaven in a resurrected, glorified body. So we are taught in the scriptures, and I said the Bible is clear on this, that we're saved by hope, that we're also sustained by such hope, and that we actually live in hope of eternal life. Now, that's my premise, my proof text are Titus 1 and verse 2 and Romans 8, verse 24, and chapter 15, verse 13. Maybe the most uh, eloquent dimension, we'll call it that, of true Christianity is this golden and substantial quality that undergirds our very being as Christians and blesses us every day of our lives. And those blessings don't just stop when we're burdened down with the affairs of life, sickness or persecution or privation of some kind. That is even when the burdens of life uh, seem as they're going to overwhelm us. We sing about this many times. L.H. Jameson wrote these encouraging words. And I said this little talk in the middle of the week is designed to be a spiritual pick-me-up. And we all know these words in the song. No night is there, no sorrow, no death, no decay, no yesterday, no morrow, but one eternal day. O Zion, lovely Zion. I long thy gates to see. O Zion, lovely Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? Faithful servants of God always, never, they never cease to do this. They always look beyond these trying times, the flesh, the burdens of the flesh, the wars, the starvation, the evil, the murders, and all that goes along with the devil's crown, this veil of tears, and even beyond the pale rider of death to the land that is fairer than day, and by faith we see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. Such hope gives us purpose in living, and anticipation in dying. Without hope, as Paul wrote, we would of all men be most pitiable, 1 Corinthians 15, 19. When you think of how most of the world, all of those who, for the most part, that are accountable to God for their actions, have no hope, and they're without God in the world. They may seem to be quite happy and joyous, but they're not. When loved ones die in the Lord, we don't sorrow as the rest of the world. Because the rest of the world, those outside of Christ, those who become unfaithful, have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Now stop and think just for a moment. What if I 
did not have the expectation of heaven. I just have before me whatever remains of this life and a fearful looking unto of the terrible retribution and vengeance of a fiery God. Now, such occasions spur us on to even a greater zeal when we face hardships, which we all do to one extent or another, that one golden day, for lack of a better way to describe it, we can go to be with God and all that's holy and good, where there's the complete, total, and absolute eternal absence of evil to be with them in that great, marvelous, supernatural realm. And I think of another old gospel song that we, at least I grew up singing these songs I've mentioned. Ever thankful am I that my Savior and Lord promised unto the weary sweet rest. Nothing more could I ask than a mansion above there to be with the saved and the blessed. When we sing those songs in worship to God, whether it's a devotion at home or in our worship with the saints on the first day of the week, they ought to rouse in our mind the fact that this life is temporary, it's fleeting, that we can never find heaven on earth, and we shouldn't look for it here. I can't think of a thing that would cause more trouble in the mind of a person than always trying to find here what God said is not here and never was meant to be here. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. It will not be here. It's not going to be here. That's why that we're saved by hope, saved by the expectation of heaven for the faithful, and we possess such an earnest desire to receive it. What great love the Father bestows upon us, John writes, that we should be called the children of God, First John 3, verse 1. Well, conversely, how very sad for those who never should have been born if they choose a life of shame and spiritual ruin. Mark 14, 21. And when the Lord himself says that people who do such evil things, it'd be better for them that never been born, that, that is really saying something. We want to think about what that means and the implications of it. And that's what it would be for those who engage in sin, who build their lives on the sand, shifting sand that is this world and what it has to offer. So to die outside of Christ is an eternal tragedy that there are no words to describe, John 8, verse 21. To be without hope and to live apart from God is too horrible to contemplate. Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 16. Do you ever think for a moment as you examine yourself as if I have no hope of heaven. If I died right now, I will not go to heaven. Well, that's a horrible thing to think of. Uh, truly, a lot of folks in all honesty and objectivity ought to think of it because the way they're living, they're not going to heaven. But I think sometimes Satan has sold us a bill of goods, and even in the church, we think, well, just maybe they'll get by. But they won't. Nobody will. And to have nothing precious to remember when life is over and to die with great, great regret spells dooms for multiplied millions of people. And that's what you would write on their tombstones if the truth would be written about them after their death. Now, since the Lord Jesus Christ has the words of eternal life and those same words will judge every one of us on the last great day, John 6, 68, and John 12, 48. It's so very unwise and foolish to march toward the, the final moment unprepared and void of legitimate Bible hope as we're trying to talk about it now. The hope we possess as Christians 
should be and really is, if we're faithful, uh, dynamic because it overwhelms the past. When we were sinful and whereof we're now ashamed, Romans 6, 21. And we hate we were ever touched by any sin because we realize what it cost our Heavenly Father to redeem us from sin. And yet there's so few people who never give it a thought about just exactly where we are in Christ and what it took to put us here. Our Redeemer made it possible for Christianity to be then the land of beginning again, where all sins, every one of them, no matter how horrendous they are, are blotted completely out, Acts 3 and verse 19. And those terrible transgressions are abundantly pardoned. Such was foretold by Isaiah in Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. Then Paul said in the New Testament, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Those willing to obey the Savior by faith in him and repentance of sins and baptism into Christ are blending their obedience and their conversion into the life of, of hope that only the gospel of Jesus Christ can convey. If you go back and read the sermon, Peter's sermon among the apostles on the day of Pentecost, the day the church started, you'll, you'll see how he does that in talking about hope and the resurrection. Well, presently, we reside upon the earth. What does that hope do for us here? It helps us look beyond the pain and agony and shame and hurt and heartache and burdens, and it brings the future nearer. It gives substance and depth and meaning to living the Christian life. Our life has boundaries, obviously. And James put it this way, that is our life in the flesh. James 4 and verse 15, in talking about planning to go places and buy and sell, he said, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Uh, so we're sustained in the vibrant power of a, we'll call it a much closer walk with God as he guides us continually, Isaiah 58, 11. Of course, he does so by his gracious, benevolent hand, as it were, Psalm 84, 11. He's our everlasting portion, the friend who sticks closer than a brother, and the one who guides our feet in the way of peace, Luke 1, verse 79. So what is our future as faithful Christians? Well, many times we think about our future here on earth, but, you know, that ends. Our future is bright, very bright because the sovereign God is in control and he's our heavenly father. As is promised, he will guide me with his counsel and afterwards receive me to glory, Psalm 73, 24. I believe the last two verses of Jude inform us that God is able to present us faultless before God in his presence with exceeding joy. That's one of the most amazing things about the great scheme of redemption, that God can take men who deserve eternal damnation because of their faith and obedient faith in Christ and a life lived by the truth of the gospel. We will appear before God Almighty faultless. Christians, therefore, have this foretaste, as we sing about sometime of glory divine and joy unspeakable. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter 1, verses 7 and 8. So it's all done by this rich, vibrant hope that attends to every faithful child of God now, Mark 10, verse 30. We have comrades of like precious faith, like precious riches in their faithful service to God. Peace in believing in God. Purpose in living. And then, of course, 
what this lesson's all about is hope in dying. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after that's the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. But it doesn't end there, does it? What a marvelous life of depth, faithfulness, and loyalty is the pilgrim journey of the devoted, faithful child of God. Now, what does this all mean? Well, let us overcome the frailties, the weaknesses, the foibles of our existence in the flesh. Overcoming the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Following the truth of God so that we can enjoy in that final day our reunion in glorified bodies with all the righteous of the ages, the angels, and God, of course, himself. The one thing we all should strive for is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, Psalm 23, 6 and 27, 4. And so I conclude by simply saying, may the glorious hope that faithful Christians have in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior and King, propel us, strengthen us, and undergird us into the realm of glory. Thank you.